stand, join me as we lift our voices and praise the Lord. I keep falling in love with Him over and over again. Amen. I keep falling in love with Him.
know this song, so we're going to go through it one time all together, and then we can probably switch it up a little bit. All right, ready? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Set me free, hallelujah. 
its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. glad to be here say amen. Amen. amen and uh we have just had such a wonderful time this week we had a great time uh each night at revival and i just thank you so much for inviting me uh pastor dale and he left uh, right before I preached, but just uh, appreciate you folks coming out and being a part of the meetings each each night i also appreciate those of you who uh took care of us i mean we were fed so good i think i gained 10 pounds last week we, we had such a, we, we got to go eat barbecue the first night, and then we had some of the world's best sloppy joes, right. and uh, of course the banana pudding that will knock your socks off, and then, and then last night we had the chicken spaghetti, and then this other kind of pudding that was, had white chocolate chips on it, and uh, it was just, it's just been great, and uh, I've enjoyed getting to be here with my sister and, and her husband, and, and it's just good to be here tonight. If uh, you're ready to have church tonight, let's say amen. 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 Let's open the Word of God to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. I'll give you a second to get there. And when you get there, just say amen one more time. Amen. All right. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Just therefore, my beloved brethren... Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the word of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is one of those, those great encouragement passages of Scripture. As you're, as you're studying through the word of God, Paul's writings, the book of Romans, uh, you always come across places where Paul comes to a conclusion, and he, uh, he, 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 he begins to give us some some instruction. He begins to give us some encouragement. He begins to tell us uh, what all this means that he's been telling us. And he, he comes to a conclusion here for us. And, and it's a great encouragement verse. And it urges us, it commands us to stay busy in the work of the Lord. To keep on doing the Lord's work. Serve the Lord and, and don't quit. Don't give up. Hang in there. Don't even think about throwing in the towel until one day when we can look the Lord in the eyes and we can hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, and, and, and the word of God encourages us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, there was uh, a lady that came into her son's room and said, uh, son, it's time to get up. It's time to go to church. And he said, oh, mama, I'm not going to church today. And she said, oh, yes, you are. We don't do that in my house. Uh, we don't decide, you know, I make the rules here, and so it's time for you to get up and go to church. He said, I don't want to go to church. Mama, please don't make me go to church. And she said, you're going to church. He said, Mama, I don't like it there. It's boring, and those people don't like me, and I don't like them. And she said, well, you're going anyway, so get up and get ready. He said, Mama, can you give me three good reasons why I should go to church this morning? She said, well, son, it's good for you. And then, son, the Lord wants you to do it. So you should do it because the Lord wants you to. And then thirdly, son, you're the pastor, and you're supposed to preach this morning. So you need to get up and, and go to church. Can you imagine a pastor having that kind of attitude towards going to church? But of course, the truth is, pastors are people too. And uh, we get tired. And, and there are times when we have problems in our attitudes, and we don't have the want to to do what we're supposed to. And I understand that people get tired sometimes, but what I can't understand 
is a person who has been saved who can't get happy. A person who's been saved who can't get excited about the Lord's work. I mean, do you realize what it is that we have here as Christians? Can you begin to fathom the, the gift that God has given us through the precious blood of Jesus Christ? God's Son, Jesus Christ, has laid down His life and He's suffered in our place for the sins that we've committed. And, yeah. and He's paid the ultimate price. He's died for us, pouring out His blood, dying for you and me. And now here we stand saved for all eternity, forgiven of our sin, yeah. rescued from hell. Our way has been paid. Yeah. Eternal life in heaven is ours. Do you realize what we have? Right. And again, I, I, I bring you back to that verse of Scripture that I read uh, quite a few times to you already. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. We're the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And I love that verse of scripture because it says, beloved, now we are the sons of God. And that is a good thing. To be a child of God is a good thing. We have such great life just to be a child of God. But it's going to get better. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we, he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And so, do you understand what we have? We have something great. And it's only going to get much, much, much better. I can't even describe it. And I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why some Christians can't get excited about what God has done for us. But not only that, I don't understand why I can't get excited about getting involved in the work of the Lord. There's a lot of things going on out there in the world. A lot of things that causes that people get involved in. I watch the commercials on the TV and, you know, people send money in because they see the little dogs in the cages. In the old dog, I'm not candidating to be your song with good Scott. He's doing a good job. But uh, you feel so sorry. People get all, you know, that, that seems like something. They feel compassion and they want to get involved. They want to help those little furry critters. You know, I've got a little dog at home. If I'd have got here first, I wouldn't have had all four of my kids. But, they're, they're precious. but we have all kinds of causes that people want to get involved in, people want to send money to. But I tell you, I got news for you today. We as Christians, by far, we have the best cause. There's not anything that's better, not anything that's that's greater. We have the, the greatest cause. We have the greatest mission. We possess the greatest promises. We possess the greatest joy. We have the greatest hero. We make the greatest difference. We have the greatest love. We enjoy the greatest fellowship. We have the best friends. We have the best future. We have the most potential. We have the greatest hope. We have the greatest cause. We have the greatest security. We have the greatest victory. You know, the world can stand around and hold hands all day singing, we are the world. But they don't have anything that can compare to the gift that God has given us through the precious blood of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet still, in spite of all that the Lord's given us, it never ceases to amaze me that many Christians can't get happy about it. Christians can't get excited about it. Many Christians can't get motivated to get involved in the Lord's work. But the Apostle Paul says to us here in our scripture text, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in what? The work of the Lord. You can ask me, what exactly is the work of the Lord? Well, I'm glad you asked. That answer is very simple. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, the religious leaders of Israel Ask Jesus. They had some different kind of motivations, but they asked Jesus, what can we do? What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, the work of God. This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And that's Christ. That's the work of God that you believe on Christ whom he hath sent. The work of the Lord is the work of the gospel work. When someone hears that old great message that God sent His Son into the world, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting yeah. life. And so if you want to get involved in the work of the Lord, then get involved in sharing the gospel with people. 
in any way that you can. If your church is having a vacation Bible school, bringing children from this neighborhood and teaching them about Jesus, then you quit making excuses why you don't want to. Yeah, and you right. get your name on that list. And you get up here to this church and you be a part of that. You get involved. You invite your friends and your neighbors to come to this church where they can hear the message preached and maybe they can have a chance to get saved. You tell somebody about Jesus. And if you don't know how to do that, I guarantee you, Brother Dale would be happy to sit down with you. I guarantee you, Miss Melody, she'd be happy to sit down with you. Sister Melody, we, we don't call, our, us Baptists don't usually call our lady sister so-and-so. I mean, that, that sounds like a nun. Can't you see this thing that you know? But uh, yeah, Sister Melody, she's a sister. And, uh, but, but she'd be glad to sit down with you and take the Word of God. You know, they'll take you through the Roman road and show you some scriptures that you can use, take you through some other parts of the Bible and give you some scriptures that, that you can use to be able to talk to people about how that we're all sinners, all in sin and come short of the glory of God. They'll give you some scriptures about how that there's a consequence for sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. They'll show you some scriptures about what Christ did for us. Romans 5 and 8, but God, so, but God commended his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. If you don't know how to share the gospel with somebody, they'll be glad to sit down and teach you. I'd be glad to sit down with you for a while and we can practice it. You can work on me. Then you can go use it on your neighbor and, you know, maybe after about three or four people, you won't scare them off too much, but it'll be great. Mm -hmm. you, you should talk to people about Jesus. You can try it. You know, one of the greatest things that you have going for you, you have your own story about how you came to know yeah, Jesus right. Christ. And you know, don't ever look down on that story because that's a very special thing, how you came to be saved. Maybe you were sitting in the church one day looking out the window trying to pass the time, but all of a sudden, you know, some of the preachers said got your attention, or maybe you were sitting in a Sunday school class, or maybe you were at a youth camp like me, you know, and you heard a preacher going crazy up there, and you just heard about Jesus, and you realize that I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved. And, and I'm sorry for my sin. And you cried out to God that day. And you got saved. And, and, and that's the work of the Lord. Yeah. I believe, I want to tell you, everybody's all tied up in knots about this election. There's more that goes on in the little Sunday school room <laughs> where a teacher is taking a Bible. Yeah. A little Sunday school teacher talks to three or four kids about Jesus and teaches them things. That's more important than what goes on with all 535 of those guys sitting in those seats getting all our votes and tying up all our emotions yeah. and spending all our money. And it's, it's more important than anything that happens in the Oval Office when somebody hears about yeah. Jesus. Yeah. we got a great job here. And we ought to get involved in it in any way that we can. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And there's three things that Paul really tells us in those words. Three kind of instructions, three things. First, he says, be steadfast. Be steadfast, and that means to be faithful. If you have a job in this church, then you ought to be in your place, and, and you ought to be faithful to do that job. Don't make the church worry about you not being here. And I'm so impressed with Miss Denise. You know, she does such a good job playing that piano, and Brother Scott, and up there singing the songs. And, and, it, I, and I, I was really amazed by Brother Chad, every night that we've got here, he was here before the preacher, you know? And, uh, and he had the lights on and had everything set up. And he never complained. A lot of people complained to him. I saw him when the uh, sound system made a noise and Sister Melody looked over at him. And he, was, uh, he just smiles, you know. He said, that's going on Facebook. But uh, I'll tell you. And, and, and I look at the people around the church here, and I tell you, you've got a sweet group of people, people that have fed us, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but when you have a job, you know, be faithful. You know, Brother Chad, he's been doing that job back there for 15 years, you know. Hardly anybody ever goes back there and says, thank you, Brother Chad. But thank you, Brother Chad. Can we give him a hand? Yeah. And a lot of people in this church that are faithful to do their job, and that's what the Word of God tells us to be. Be steadfast. Be faithful. Secondly, Paul tells us to be unmovable. And that means you don't let anything stop you from doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. You don't make excuses. So what, what did we sing tonight? I shall not be, I shall not be moved. 
okay, but that doesn't mean you sit in a pew and nobody can move you out of your seat. Yeah. That means that when you're working for the Lord, nobody can move you away from that job you're doing for, yeah. for the Lord. Though the hurricane winds blow against you and try to blow, I, you're unmovable. And, and you don't let anything stop you, so you don't make excuses. Little Jimmy's baseball game is not more important. Yeah. You don't need to go camping every three weekends. You need to be in your place in this church faithfully doing your part to bring people yeah. to Christ. Be unmovable in that. And then third, Paul tells us to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. That word always abounding. You know you know what always means. It's, it's just constant. Constantly. And then abounding is multiplying. It's doing it more and more. Not less and less. And so three things Paul tells us. Do the work of the Lord faithfully. Don't let anybody stop you. And do more and more of it all the time. And I know some of you, maybe you were thinking about getting ready to go in and have a talk with Pastor Dale and, and tell him how tired and overburdened, burned out you're feeling and how you need to just kind of lay down some of them responsibilities for a while. But the Word of God is telling you tonight, don't do it. Tonight's the night the Lord wants to tell you to rededicate yourself to His work and say, yes, Lord, I'll do your will and I'll serve you and I'll be faithfully and, and, I'll, and I'll be willing to do it more and more. Whatever you have. The truth is, in the church today, we have people wanting to do less and less. Yeah, that's right. It's sad. I've been in the ministry for 30 years and I've heard every reason, I've heard every excuse why people don't want yeah. the, the Lord's work. I'd like to take you over to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 14. I want to read to you a parable that the Lord Jesus told. Luke chapter 14. And I want you to see here uh, what happened. Luke 14, verse, beginning in verse 16. If you're there, can you say amen? amen. All right. Verse 16 of Luke 14 says, A certain man made a great supper, and he bade many. He invited a whole lot of people. He sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Now, let me tell you something. That is a really lame excuse. <laughs> How many of you ever bought a piece of ground, a piece of property, that you haven't even gone to look at? I need to go see it. Now, that's a goofiest thing. That is a goofy excuse. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. Okay, again, it's a goofy, dumb excuse. Uh, I, I pray that you have me excused. Would you buy a car without just yeah. kicking the tires and checking it out and looking? I have bought. I think these guys are lying. I think that the Lord wants to know how goofy and silly these excuses are. And then uh, uh, another, verse 20, another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. <laughs> hey, Bridget won't let me. <laughs> so that servant... All of them made excuses. He invited many, but, but all of them made excuses. And so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. He said, they've all said they can't be there. They've all got a reason they can't be here. I want you to see this in verse 21. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly in the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. You know what? They won't think they're too good for what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's good. And the servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded, yet there's still room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house might be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste my supper. Do you think it offends the Lord when he invites you to be a part of the greatest thing that ever existed? Do you think it offends the Lord? Do you think it hurts him? I remember one night this lady invited us to supper and I mean she made fried chicken and she made mashed potatoes with gravy and it wasn't pioneer. It was a it was real kill the pig and and, and fry the bacon and cook the gravy from the bacon tree. Say, man, 
she she made some some food and, and, and some of the it was a wonderful, wonderful meal. And she must have spent hours yeah. and she must have spent money. I can't think. Yeah. There was so much stuff there. It was like going to a church dinner, you know, there was so much. I guess she thought, you know, since a preacher was coming, she needed to make it like dinner on the ground. And she probably saw me. But uh, it was so good. She just worked so hard. And I thought, well, you know, what if she had, had done all this for us? Yeah. And what if I had just, uh, if, if I, if time for me and my family to be there and we didn't show yeah, up? That's good. What, what, how would she feel? And, and so she calls this brother Chris, are you and the family coming over? And, oh, I'm so sorry. We was watching Desperate Housewives. At home. We, we, we were just watching my wife's favorite TV show. You know? Brother Chris likes to watch the Gospel Hour, you know. But you know Bridget likes the Desperate Housewives. But how, how would she feel? Wouldn't that be an insult? Yeah. Wouldn't that be a rude way for me to treat that lady? And and it's. Do you think it offends the Lord when He has invited us to be a part of the greatest thing? that ever existed, and we start making up all these excuses, we start coming up with all these reasons why we don't want to get involved because we've got all this stuff out there in the world that we're, we're doing, we've got all these things that we think are so much better, we've got all these things that we think are so much more important than this yeah, great right. thing that God yeah. has given us, this wonderful gift that God has bought and paid for by the precious blood of the Son of Jesus Christ. And he wants to give it to you. He wants to be a part of it because he loves you. And you know what? When you do that, when you make excuses, you say, God, I've got something more important to want. God says, okay, you think what I have is not good enough for you? Fine, I'll just give it to somebody who really, really wants it. Who really desires it. Who won't stick their nose up. Don't make excuses. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We read this passage last night, but it's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's about all the things that the Apostle Paul went through as he was uh, in the ministry. All the suffering he went through in 2 Corinthians. And, and, and I want you to hear what he says in, in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 23. I'm going to read this again. He says, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Uh, of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Uh, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of the waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul says, man, I've had a, a lot of hard work to do, and I've been in a lot of tough situations. I've done a lot of suffering. And you just think about that, that it is Paul saying this to us. If there's anybody in the world, you think about all the struggles he's been through, and if there was any person in the history of Christianity that you could look at him and say, hey, Paul, man, we understand if you want to quit. This guy has been yeah. through so much, yeah. and, and, and we totally understand if, if, if he says, you know what, I'm done. I need a break. I just, I just need to quit. I need, just need to hang it up. But he's not saying that. This guy who's been yeah. through all this is saying to us, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We can look at that list of things Paul went through, and we can't say that we've been through that. Should we really be thinking about quitting? Should we That's really good, be thinking about retiring from the Lord's work? He's saying it's not time to quit. I want to keep working. I don't want to let anything stop me. I want to do more for Jesus. And the question is, now here with everything that Paul has suffered through, how could he keep that kind of attitude? How could he, he just continue to, to want to serve the Lord? I want to take you back to that verse. And we've said it over and over again, but I want to take you through this verse. And I want to show you, because, because I believe Paul gives us three reasons why, three reasons, three important reasons why this is this can be important in our hearts and it can be worth it and why we should hang in there. Three reasons that make it worth it to continue.
continue to serve the Lord, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so the first reason, number one, is because your Savior lives. Mm. That's number Amen. one. And, and you say, well, where does it say that in 1 Corinthians and 15 and 58? Well, it says it in the word, therefore. <laughs> right? And that, you know that good rule about Bible study, I'm sure. When you find a therefore, when you're, when you're studying the Bible and you find the word therefore, if you don't know what it's there for, you need to go back in front of it, before it, and you need to read and find out what the therefore is there for. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and when you look back in the earlier parts, because this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when, you, when, you, when you're going through and reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what Paul is talking about there is the resurrection yeah. of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a, as Brother Brett saying, a living hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 14, I want to read to you some of the things Paul said there about the resurrection. He said, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. That would mean I'm wasting my time. Yeah. Yeah. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain. That would mean that you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. Yea, and we are found false witness of, uh, witnesses yeah. of God. If Christ isn't risen, then this is all a big lie. Just lying to you. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he, whom he raised not up. But if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is in vain. Yeah, that's right. And you are yet in your yeah. sins. It means you're still under the burden of your sin. Yeah. Yeah. If Christ isn't risen, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. We have no hope for those yeah. who died if Christ isn't risen. Yeah. But he's risen in you. Yeah. Yeah. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Do you see that? Paul is talking about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And he's telling us that this is our hope. Without the resurrection of Jesus, what would our faith mean? I mean, if Christ just went to Calvary and then he died, and that was the end of the story, that would be a very sad ending yeah. to a very powerless story. And it wouldn't mean much at all. But you can still go to the city of Jerusalem today. And you can still go to the ancient tomb in the garden of Joseph of Arimathea. And the, you can see the place where they laid the body of Jesus one day after he was crucified. And when you get there, you can look inside. But you will not find his body. And you will not find his remains. You will find a sign on the outside of the tomb. And it says, he is not here. He is risen as he said. Amen. And the fact that Jesus is risen... It gives us all the hope. It gives us all the victory. Death could not keep him down. And it's not going to be able to keep us down either. Yeah. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming. And now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. Jesus said, there's coming a day when... My risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is going to call my name, even after I'm in the grave. And I want you to know, Jesus only had to borrow that tomb, yeah. because he's only going to be in it in a little while. So I've been thinking about going down to the cemetery and asking how much to rent a grave. Because I'm not going to be in it forever. There's coming a resurrection. So can you give me a little bit of a discount? You know, I don't want it forever. I'm going to go on up out of it. And when I come up out of it, I'm going to be ready for a big old family reunion. And I'm going to see my mama. I'm going to see my loved ones. And we're going to sit down around the table at the marriage supper of the lamb. And I'm going to eat a big old pile of mashed potatoes with bacon gravy all over it. Don't quit. Keep on going. Be ye steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord because it's going to be worth it for you. And it's going to be worth it for everybody in the resurrection when Christ calls her. Because that's going to be a wonderful day. Second, really, the second reason Paul gives us here is because you are so loved. Your Savior lives and you are so loved. Look at uh, verse 58 again. He says, therefore, and in the next three words, he says, my beloved brethren. Have you ever noticed that 
John 3.16 doesn't say, God loved the world, so he gave his only begotten son. No, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That word so is important because that means God means God loves you so much he let his own son die in your yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would like to believe that I love people a lot. I love my church members. It doesn't take me long to fall in love with people. Uh, but I don't want to let my children die for anybody, you know. And I have to confess, you know, if, if there was a choice, you know, between if there was something to go down here at the church, you know, I, I have a feeling if anybody tried to come in and and shoot the place up. I don't think they'd get very far in this group. There, there might be some people killed in the crossfire, but uh, I don't think that uh, they'd get very far. But uh, but one of the things that, uh, if, I think if somebody, you know, something went down, and, you know, I think the first thought in my mind, and I should love everybody, but I think I love my family more than anybody. I would try to protect my wife, and I try to protect my son, and I'd probably try to protect myself a little bit too. Uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, I think about is, is that, you know, Jesus didn't put his son first. The Christ, the Lord God, the Father, did not put his son Jesus before, you know, first. He put us yeah. before him. He let him die for us. And that is, that is a great love, yeah. to be able to, to be willing to sacrifice his son. And that's an amazing thing. You are so, so loved. But, you know, in this context here, as we look at this, this scripture here, Paul's not talking about God's love for you here. Mm -hmm. Paul is talking about his own love for his brethren. And the, the fact is, I want you to be encouraged tonight. Young people, I want you to be encouraged. Guys, I, I want you to understand that there's a place, there's a, there's a family in this church that loves you very much. We are a family here, and, and we're, we're brought together by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And, and I, I want you to understand, you know, this is not a perfect group of people here in the church. This is not a perfect church. You're going to find some mistakes. You're going to find some flaws here. But I'll tell you something. You're going to, what you are going to find is a group of people that, who, who will love you here. And, and, and when the rest of the world casts you out, and when the rest of the world... Uh, just is done with you, and they won't give you another chance. You'll find your, some arms open wide to you right here in this place, because this church is a family brought together, kept together by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and they love each other. And, and I want to tell you something tonight. When, when you feel discouraged, and you feel like you're ready to give up and quit, I want you to be encouraged in the fact that not only does God love you more than you could ever dream, but there's a group of people over here at Faith Baptist Church that love you more than you could ever imagine. They would do anything they can for you. Don't you ever even think about it. Because you belong to a family here. And so get involved in this family. I'm so glad there's a Faith Baptist Church here. I'm so glad that y'all still get together and that you open the books and you sing the songs of praise to the Lord. I'm glad that you get the Bible out and you preach from the Word of God and you learn from the Word of God and you grow in the Word of God. I'm glad you have Sunday school and I'm glad that you send out missionaries. There's more important things going on in this place than any other place you could ever be in the world. That's right. There's a lot of love to be had here. Thirdly and finally, don't quit, don't give up, because your service is lasting. It is, and may I say it is everlasting. Listen, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, but that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You, you will never waste one single second serving the Lord. You will never waste a second. When you work for the Lord, it ought to help to encourage you to know that you're not wasting your time because our God is not only a God of judgment, but he's also a God of reward. There is nothing you can ever do for him and for his kingdom that he will ever go unnoticed because he sees it all. I love that my God is a God of reward. Without faith, it's impossible to please God for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Three times in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, uh, Jesus tells us that we shouldn't pray 
to be seen of men. We shouldn't uh, give our alms to be seen of men. We shouldn't uh, make, try to make it obvious when we're fasting, you know. Don't uh, try to make yourself appear to be hungry so that you can tell her, no, I'm fasting, you're not spiritual. You know? We're not to, supposed to be like that because if that's what you do, if you get people to notice you and, and, and Jesus says, then you have your reward. But he says, when, when you do these things, do it by yourself. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is, is doing when you give your alms. Uh, go into your closet when you pray. When you fast, don't disfigure your face. Don't try to look hungry and, and, and weary. But do these things in secret. And your Father who sees thee in secret will, when yeah. he sees you, he will reward you openly. Because he's a God of reward. And there's nothing you can do when you do it sincerely for him that will be a waste of time. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. And listen, I understand people get tired. What you're doing in this church, when you serve this church, it is so, so important. You can't imagine how important it is. You know, lives, souls get saved in this church. Lives get changed in this church. Somebody would have ended up on the street. Somebody would have ended up in prostitution. Somebody would have ended up in drugs. Somebody would have ended up murdering somebody. Somebody would have ended up in a terrible place, but they came to this church and they heard a message of love and they felt the family loving them and they were and they heard the gospel and they came to Jesus. And so that is the greatest thing that could happen. And so don't quit. It's so important. But I understand People get tired, but here's what I'm saying. When you get tired and you need a, let, a, a little rest, then rest a little. Take a little, little break. You know, take a day off. Go fishing. Uh, take a little vacation, but then come back. Well, you know, we do need rest, but then come back and go back to work serving the Lord. Yep. Because one of these days, there's going to be no more time yes, right. to work. Because all the opportunity that God has given us in this life will be over. And it will be time for Almighty God to examine your life. Don't you want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want the angels to have to come drag me across the finish line at the end of my life. Because I gave up way too early. And I want you to be able to run across that finish line of this life. And be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. I want you to be able to meet him and be unashamed because you, you ran the race. I don't want you to be ashamed in that day because you ran a little while. And then you quit because somebody criticized yeah. you. Somebody hurt your feelings. Or, or you just wanted to retire and take it easy for the rest of your life. Listen, we can retire when we go to heaven. Yeah. And it will be the eternally uh, best retirement you could ever. And there's no risk involved in that retirement. Listen, don't quit. I know everybody can't do everything. But everybody can do something. Right. And, and you need, as a Christian, you need to figure out what it is that God has gifted you to do. And you need to start doing that with all your heart. We used to have this little old lady at Castleberry Baptist Church in Fort Worth, and she had a walker. And she, I, I don't know how old she was when she finally passed away, but she had a walker, and she would come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If the janitor came to clean the windows on Friday, she came and watched him do it. But she would, and she had that walker with those tennis balls on it. And I know it hurt her to walk because I could see that, that she just moved so slow. But she would take tiny little steps, and she moved so slow with that little walker. But, you know, every person that came in that church, she would crochet them a pillow and give it to them. She would give it. And her name was Ozell Parrish. She would make a, a pillow and, and crochet it. And when we came there as youth pastor, she made our family a pillow. And when a missionary came to visit our church, she would crochet that missionary, their family, a pillow. And every person that came to our church that visited our church, and she'd see them, and the next, the next time they came back, she would bring them a pillow that she had made. And it was just kind of her thing that she did. But you know, her hands hurt, she had arthritis, and her body hurt, but she came to church every time so faithfully. She didn't quit. She was steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
And every time you see her, you say, how you doing, Miss Parrish? And she said, oh, I'm doing wonderful. God has blessed me so much. And she would cry all those times. Just said, don't quit. Figure out what you can do for the Lord. Figure out what God has gifted you to do. And do that with all your heart. And don't you dare, and don't you even think about it. And one of these days, when you do finally cross that finish line of your life, you're going to hear the thunderous applause of a great cloud of witnesses who've been watching your life from the grandstands of heaven. They've been watching your life and they've been cheering. You fell down and they were cheering on you. They went on before you, but they've been waiting for you and they were cheering for you. In that moment that you fell, they, they were encouraging you to get back up and get back in the race. And then you're going to get back up. You know, you're going to get there to heaven in that cloud of witnesses. And then you're going to realize that you are in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And, and you're going to realize you're face to face with Jesus. The one who both created you and died for you. And you're going to notice that you're not tired in your mo anymore. And your body doesn't hurt. And you're not breathing heavy. And you feel better than you've ever felt in your life. And you've got more joy. And you're going to look into the eyes of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the very first time. And you're going to hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in the joy of the Lord. And then you're going to begin to witness as a great multitude. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands as they all begin to fall to their knees and bow before the one who sits on the throne. And that entire multitude of people gathered together in heaven is going to begin to form an enormous heavenly choir. Singing in perfect harmony, in perfect tune. A song that goes something like this. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And on that day, when you realize that everything you believed in, everything you were created for, everything you were waiting on has finally arrived. Your heart is going to be overwhelmingly awed by the fact that you've just experienced in a single moment more joy than you ever experienced in your entire lifetime. Yet you're still going to have the endless stages of eternity to enjoy the glory of your Father's kingdom and your Savior's presence. I do not believe in that moment that there will be any questions in anybody's mind about whether or not it was worth it. Mm. Oh, it would be worth it. Because your Savior leaves. Yeah. Because you are so loved. Because your service was lasting and everlasting. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. You ought to be thankful that God sent Brother Dale over here to you. Amen. I tell you, he is a great husband, he's a great father, and he's a great pastor, and he's a humble one. And he loves people. And he loves the Word of God. I believe it's going to be a blessing for you. I believe Bill is going to be all right too. Yeah. I don't know. I want to ask you to stand with me. Do you feel the Lord's blessed your heart tonight? Do you feel the Lord has, has uh, spoken to your heart tonight? Would you bow your heads just for a moment as we pray together and as our musicians begin to play on the piano? We pray, Lord, now that you might bless us in the church. Almighty God, Lord, we've already got one praying here at the altar. And Lord, maybe there's others tonight. Have a need. Maybe there's somebody here that's never accepted Christ as Savior. Even before, Lord, uh, we begin this invitation, I would just uh, say to anyone here that's never accepted Christ as Savior that Jesus loves you so much, He came and laid His life down on that cross. God loves you so much that he sent his own son to take your place and take your punishment. He suffered and died on that cross to pay the price for your sins so you wouldn't have to. And if you've never accepted him as Savior, don't turn him away now. 
Don't make an excuse and say, I've got something more important. If you're not saved, you need to be saved today. Won't you, won't you call out to him? Like that thief who was hanging on the cross and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Why don't you call out to him like that publican there in the temple who would not even look up into heaven, but smote upon his own breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said that he went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why don't you call out to him? Because the word of God says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you put your faith in Jesus? Would you pray with me tonight and just say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Pray something like that. I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I ask you, Lord, to wash all my sin away in the precious blood of your son, Jesus. I believe that your son, Jesus, came and died for me on that cross. And I believe that the Lord Jesus rose again from the grave. And Lord, I put my trust in Jesus right now. I ask you to save me, God. Give me all my sin right now. Put my trust in you because I can't do it myself. Just trust my soul in your hands. I ask you to save me. And I pray in Jesus' name. If you're here today, we're going to ask you to come. God, we ask you to bless this invitation. Have your will and your way in every life. Whoever needs to come and pray, we pray, Lord, they won't hesitate, not a moment. They need to make a commitment tonight to whatever the decision. Pray for our nation. Pray for their family. Pray for a loved one. Pray for a lost person. Pray about sharing the gospel. Pray about serving a new church. God, do your will here. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.
Father, for this time that we've had to come to listen to your word, to praise you, and to sing songs, and worship to your name. It is our prayer that our worship tonight has been acceptable to you. Lord, as we do our separate ways, we thank you for Brother Chris and Brent, as they have shared their hearts with us this week. Father, we just ask that you would bless them in their ministry back to forward, that you give them safe passage, Lord, as they go home tomorrow, or that you would give them a renewed spirit as they minister to their church. We thank you, Father, for sharing with us this week, for the blessing that they make to us. Father, we just ask that uh, as our church goes forward in these next few weeks and months, that you would give us fruits for our labor, Lord, that you bless us, folks who not only want to know you, but folks who want to serve you, folks who want to bring other people to you. Thank you, God, for your goodness. 